associated okay. with them. But before I get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all I do when I upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please tar and feather the like button and then subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. In September 2006, 26-year-old Jody Arias met 29-year-old Travis Alexander at a big business convention um, in Las Vegas. The I heard about this case. You guys already know all my, um, what was it, serial killers on video. I, I talked to you about this. The two hit it off immediately, with Travis, on the same day he met her, inviting Jody to be his guest at his company's formal dinner that night. After the dinner was over, Travis and Jody stayed up all night chatting with each other, and the next day, Travis was telling his friends at this convention that he had, quote, found his wife. After the convention was over, Travis and Jody would continue to see each other, even though it was a long-distance relationship. Travis lived in Arizona, and Jody lived in California. But they would meet up, and they would travel and take beautiful pictures and post to social media. It just seemed like they were a dream couple that were so happy together. While the couple's social media posts might have made it seem like they were this perfect couple, Travis's friends began to notice some very strange behavior by Jody early on in their relationship. Jody just seemed totally obsessed with Travis. She could not keep her hands off of him. Travis would be talking to his friends and Jody would come up beside him and literally grab onto him and cling to him. And Travis would try to push her off of him and she would just come right back and grab onto him. But it wasn't playful and joking jokey and funny. It was like she literally needed to be holding on to Travis. Jody would get really upset anytime Travis was interacting with a female, didn't matter their age or their relationship to Travis. It was like she just could not hack any other females in his life. She would follow Travis anytime he went to the bathroom and she would put her ear to the door and try to eavesdrop in case there was somebody else in the bathroom that Travis could have been talking to. She began showing up to Travis's house totally unannounced at all hours. And one time when the house was locked and Travis wasn't even home, she snuck into the house through the doggy door. Initially, Travis's friends just thought it was weird behavior, but over time, they started to feel like Jody might actually be dangerous. And so they sat him down one day and they kind of had like an intervention and they said, hey, Travis, there is something off about Jody. Her behavior is just totally weird and it seems like she is just never going to let you go. I think you need to break this off and just find a way to cut ties with this woman. As they're speaking to him, they hear something outside of the room they're in, which had all the doors closed. And Travis stands up, walks over, opens the door, and standing right there is Jody. She was eavesdropping, and she was furious. And she looked in at all of them and gave them absolute death stares and stormed off. Shortly after this intervention, Travis takes his friend's advice and he does break it off with Jody and he kind of moves on with his life. Now remember, he lives in Arizona and Jody lives in California, so you'd think it would be pretty easy to break up because you're never going to run into each other. And that's what Travis was kind of banking on, that he could get a fresh start and never see her again. But about two weeks after they broke up, Jody moved to Arizona. Around the same time, Travis starts dating a new woman named Lisa, and almost immediately, Jody starts stalking Lisa, showing up at her house, tapping on her windows, and running away. She starts slashing Travis's tires. I mean, she was a total menace. She was trying to break them up. But a few months after she arrived in Arizona, Jody ultimately packs up and heads back to California in April of 2008. And Travis, Lisa, his girlfriend, and all of Travis's friends are so relieved, they felt like now the breakup is final. Two months after Jody leaves Arizona and goes back to California, Travis misses a really big business meeting. And at first, his friends are calling him and kind of giving him a hard time about missing this meeting, but he wasn't responding. And after a couple of days, his friends decided they needed to go do a welfare check and make sure he really was okay. They go to his house, they open it up, and immediately when they walk in, they see blood on the carpet and they're calling out for Travis. Travis is nowhere to be found. They walk through the house and they discover in the bathroom Travis's body. He was dead and laying in the tub. They call the police who come over and immediately suspect Jody Arias, who denies that she was ever there, that she had left, she was in Arizona, that she had nothing to do with this. 
But during the investigation, they find a camera inside of the washing machine inside of Travis's house. They were able to dry it off and extract the last few pictures that were taken on the camera. The first few pictures are of Jody herself. She's clearly inside of Travis's house. And then at some point she goes into the bathroom where Travis was, he's taking a shower. She takes this picture and then immediately following this picture, she proceeds to stab Travis to death. In May of 2013, Jody Arias was found guilty of first degree murder and was sentenced to life in jail without parole. Wow. It's still haunting the, how he- um... By September of 1985, the Nevado del Ruiz volcano in Colombia was- That picture is like still haunting. Like, I can't, I can't imagine what he was feeling when she, he was looking straight at her while taking that photo. While she was taking that photo of him during, like, his final moments. I can't imagine that. Starting to show signs of significant activity. The tremors had become so powerful that the citizens of a nearby town called Amero, that was home to 31,000 people, they started to become very concerned. You know, if this thing were to go off, we're only 30 miles away, we'd be leveled. And unfortunately, just a couple of months later, on November 13th, 1985, the volcano would erupt and it would create a massive mudslide that would just devastate Amero. The mud flow covered 85% of this town in heavy, thick sludge, it destroyed buildings and bridges, and it killed 25,000 people. Remember, there's only 31,000 people in this village to begin with, so 80% of the population has been killed by this mudslide. Because of how big of a disaster this was, it took a while for the rescue efforts to mobilize, and so anybody that was on the fringe of being saved, unfortunately, perished because no one was there to rescue them in time. And then when rescue crews did get out and did start helping people, there just wasn't enough. There weren't enough people to help. And so hundreds of people that could have been saved were just trapped and no one could get to them in time. Photojournalist Frank Fournier arrived in Colombia two days after this eruption with the intent to photograph the ground rescue that was going on inside of Amero. When he actually arrived in Amero, he was really shocked to see just how completely destroyed this town was and how totally ineffective the rescue efforts were. It was just totally chaotic. It wasn't really clear who was helping who. There were people literally dying all over the place. It just seemed crazy that this was not being handled better. Amid this chaos, a farmer approached Frank and told him he needed to come over and try to help this girl who was trapped under a house. So he brings Frank over to this house that's been completely submerged in water and mud and clinging to a branch is this 13 year old girl named Omira Sanchez that's been trapped up to her neck in water. She's pinned by something in the water. They didn't know what it was, but she's been there for 60 hours. When Frank arrived, he spoke to the other rescuers that were there trying to get her out. And they said that she's been in great spirits and she's been joking about how she doesn't want to be late for school. She's just been a really positive force and we really want to get her out. But, you know, it keeps raining, so the water keeps rising and she's already up to her neck and she's just trapped. We can't get her out. Shortly after Frank arrives, Omira went from chipper and lively and kind of making light of everything to most likely realizing that she wasn't going to get out of the water. And so she began telling the rescue workers to let her be, to let her rest. And she propped herself over this branch and she just laid there kind of allowing herself to pass away. Frank felt totally helpless. I mean, he's looking at this poor girl that's going to die unless they can get her out of the water, but no one seems to be able to do it. And it just seemed totally impossible that we can't just find a way to get her out. But it would turn out that her foot was pinned under a brick door and her aunt who had passed away and was trapped under the rubble had grabbed her ankle and had died that way. So it was like a death grip on her ankle. And so not knowing what to do, Frank just did what he knew how to do, which was take pictures. And he knelt down and he took this picture of Omira. And very shortly after this picture was taken, she would pass away. This picture would win the 1986 World Press Photo of the Year. When it was published, it was so disturbing that this poor girl was not able to be rescued, that it created an international backlash on Colombia's nearly non-existent rescue efforts. That picture too still haunts me. I mean, her eyes, her eyes, you can see the pain. Her eyes, all dark, black. Oh my God. 13 years old. Wow. Oh, 
Okay, well, let me see. Suit. Ed Gein was always a little bit off. His classmates and his teachers recalled him being very shy, but at the same time, having these strange mannerisms where all of a sudden he would burst out hysterically laughing, usually at something he had been muttering to himself in class. The school blamed Ed's mother for Ed's kind of odd mm -hmm. behavior because Ed would admit that his mother punished him if he showed signs of having friends. So Ed's childhood was incredibly lonely and isolated. Ed's mother would confine he, along with his brother Henry, to their farm. He was basically never allowed to leave with the exception of school, and when he was at the farm, his mother would regularly read from the Bible and would tell Ed and his brother Henry that basically everybody else in the world is evil. We are the only pure ones. Everyone is evil and you should stay away from them. In 1944, when Ed was 38 years old, he and his brother Henry were burning away some marsh vegetation on their property. And at some point the fire got out of control and the fire department had to be called in. And after they put out the fire, Ed was okay, but they couldn't find Henry. He was just gone. That night, Henry's body was found face down in the marsh in that same area where the burn was going on. He had died of asphyxiation. At first, the fire was blamed, but then authorities discovered that Henry had actually died before the fire started. And so all eyes turned to Ed, who was the only one with him at the time, but there was no hard evidence connecting Ed to Henry, and Ed said, I didn't do it. So Henry's death remained labeled an accident, even though basically everyone believed that Ed must have been the guy that strangled his brother to death before the fire was set. Shortly after his brother's death, Ed's mother also died, leaving Ed alone in this farmhouse. Ed began to make some modifications to the farmhouse, not to improve it or to make it bigger and better, but rather to board off all of the rooms in the house that his mother ever used. He basically made them time capsules. He didn't touch them, he just sealed them off. And so he confined himself to a single room in this farmhouse that he did not take care of. And so filth is just piling up everywhere. And so he just kind of lived in squalor in this one weird room. While living in seclusion, Ed became obsessed with cannibalism. He basically spent all his time reading about cannibalism inside of this tiny room in his boarded up farmhouse. And that's how he lived his life for the next 10 years. No one really ever saw him. Then in November of 1957, a local hardware store owner, her name was Bernice Warden, goes missing. When police show up at the store to have a look around, they find bloodstains all over the place and they discover in the register that the last person to make a purchase inside of the store was Ed Gein. So they go to Ed Gein's house to interview him and see if he knows anything about Bernice Warden. And so they're bracing themselves for probably finding her body at Ed's house. But they were not prepared for what they actually found at his house. What they find would end up inspiring movies like Silence of the Lambs, Psycho, and Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Basically, inside of Ed's house was a whole bunch of human remains, but not in the way that you would imagine. Ed was taking human body parts and making things like kitchen utensils yep. and bowls, and he was using yeah, skin okay, to create cool. seats and lampshades mm -hmm. and bedposts. I mean, his whole house was like built of human bones and flesh. Bernice Warden's body was found as well, and she was kind of hung up as if she was next up to be made into some sort of kitchen utensil or chair or table. When questioned, Ed confessed to killing Bernice Warden, but as for the dozens of other bodies that were inside of the house, he claims they were from robbing graves, but no one really knew if that was true or not, and they weren't able to ever actually convict him for anything beyond the killing of Bernice Warden. As for his motive, he told investigators that what he really wanted to do, what he intended to do, was build what he called a woman suit that would resemble his mother, and it would allow him to, quote, crawl into his mother's skin. He was deemed unfit to stand trial, and he was sent to a mental hospital where he stayed until his death in 1984. Here is just a sampling of some of the things that Ed Gein made using human body parts. What is not pictured here are things like his lampshade, his seat, as well as his gloves and his belt. If you feel so inclined, you can Google those things. All right, that's gonna do it, guys. Let me know in the comments section what you thought. Ed Gein. I knew about him. Um, he's the first serial killer that I knew. I think he was the first serial killer. Well, probably that vampire killer, Um, that real life vampire killer. I can't remember his name, but he would always like 
torture people like have them like hanging on sticks to the head to the um to the legs um between it's very very graphic like i don't i don't want to explain it but um he was the first serial killer and then it was eggling no then then it was elizabeth queen elizabeth second it was like way back in the day like the 18 1800s that serial killer uh, queen elizabeth they say um but she pa she got executed they executed her in the 19 1900s but um and then it was a glean and then it was a glean so yeah but yeah like i said i know like plenty of like not most but mostly serial killers like female and male serial killers i saw I seen did see um some biopics of serial killers too, like Monster Gracie, Charles Manson biopic. Um, who else? Some um, Jeffrey Dahmer biopic. Like I seen it all. So, anyways, hope you guys did enjoy. Make sure to subscribe, like, comment, and make sure to subscribe to Mr. Ballin. This would be my last video for today because I'm getting tired and it's also storming outside. So I really need to get off my phone. So anyways, I see you guys next time I see ya. Bye. I'm sorry if you guys can't hardly see me. I'm sorry about that.